Welcome back to the most fabulous podcast in the world, and today we're doing something a little bit different, a combined episode. A Silver Point artist known for her affair that spawned a modernist masterpiece from her writer lover, and a woman that went from the Chinese army to interwar Paris. Oh, what a pair of ladies. Who are they? Thelma Wood and Nadine Wong. As for why we're doing a combined episode, it's because neither of them has much known about them, nor do they have their own biographies. Ugh, a tragedy. I feel like we're getting this more and more once we deviate from the Natalie Barney path and and go to people who are not her. Um, They're just not as well known. They really aren't. But we'll start with Thelma Wood. She was born in Belloir or Camp or Concordia, Kansas, in 1901, to an entrepreneur who sold extracts for ice cream and confections. Hmm. Interesting. Was that a lucrative business? It apparently was, at the time anyway. He apparently lost everything by the time of the Great Depression and the stock market crash. Hmm. But it was lucrative enough that the family could move to St. Louis in 1909, and even have a live-in servant. Wow, all right. So they were doing pretty well. Yes, now, Thelma was quite striking. She was about six feet tall and claimed to have Native American ancestry. Cool. Striking enough that when she arrived in Paris in the 1920s to study sculpture, she promptly ended up in an affair with the photographer Bernice Abbott, who then introduced her to the writer Juna Barnes. I see, and this is this is how we get the whole Juna Barnes thing. Yes, her magnetism of attracting people didn't end there. But there's some controversy about her financial prospects at the time that she met Juna. So, for instance, some have said that she was fine on her own and was even seen madly driving a red Bugatti through the streets. But Juna herself said that Thelma was penniless when the relationship started and that Wood was very bad with money. Hmm. So was it maybe that she was spending a lot of money that she didn't have? Probably. She apparently had some sort of allowance or money coming from her family, but would spend it really quickly, like in two weeks. Oh, dang. Now, Juna is actually the one who convinces her to switch from sculpture to silver point art. And silver point art, for those who don't know, is basically a technique originally used for illuminating medieval manuscripts. So that's quite a change in medium. How did that happen? As I said, Juna convinced her. Do we not have any info about like what that conversation was like? Like, was Thelma set on sculpture before? I would assume she wasn't completely set on it if she was convinced to do silver point instead. Right, but she had gone to Paris to study sculpture, right? So surely that's like some level of commitment. The dead know, but they're not telling. (laughs) Fair enough. Now, at the beginning of this relationship, all was well. They got an apartment together, talked about art, and even had a cat named Dilly. And according to Mina Loy's daughter, smoked weed together. (laughs) Love our weed lesbians. Juna even dedicated Lady's Almanac to Thelma. Right. So she was a pretty important person. Yes, and then it all went downhill. As it so often does. Yes, it turns out Thelma is alcoholic and incapable of fidelity. And not only does she attract a lot of attention from men and women, she also goes after some on her own. She has an affair with the poet Edna St. Vincent Millay, on her knees proposes sex to Peggy Guggenheim, and openly flirts with some of Barnes's friends like Emily Coleman in front of Barnes. Which was not a thing that Barnes was okay with. No, she actually, rather strange for the milieu she was in, she actually wanted monogamy, which is why she once hit a man on the head with a stick when he came up to their apartment to try and seduce Thelma. Gosh. Yeah, so, not great. So we've uh, talked about Barnes's side of things and, and the sense of, like, betrayal that she felt at Thelma. But but what was Thelma's take on this? Did she feel, like, trapped? Do we have any, like, writings from her about this? Thelma would express regret 
for her drinking and make promises about quitting that she never fulfilled. There was a time where it was sort of an on-again, off-again affair before it fully died. And we should say that the drinking was related to the non-monogamy, that, that she would be having these affairs while also drinking and partying. Yes, Juna, when she couldn't have monogamy, decided she would at least get honesty, so Thelma would have to confess to everyone she slept with. But as you can imagine, Thelma is going out drinking from cafe to cafe and ending up in who's knows who's bed, and she can't remember anything, and Juna is chasing after her, getting as drunk as Thelma, and it's just a mess. <laughs> yeah, that just sounds like a bad time for both of them. Yes, so Thelma then starts an affair with Henriette Metcalf, who was a friend of the writer Colette, and this affair starts in 1928, and both move to New York. Wow, that's quite a change. Does it help her? Does she get better? And not really. So in 1934, Thelma moves to Connecticut with Metcalf and the two buy a country house there. And she actually tries to get her something to do. So Metcalf actually gives Wood a job running a gourmet catering business in Westport that fails. Ah. Oh. Now, just, well, check, um, because cause the Great Depression has happened, um, so is her family able to support her at all, or is she just kind of on her own here? No evidence of that, so we will assume that she is supported by her lovers, as Metcalf would also continue to help her financially after they would split. Mm -hmm. Yeah, does she have anything that she's, like, doing artistically at this time, or is she just trying to make a living? We don't know for sure. She had been doing Silver Point, primarily depictions of animals, and she could cook, but she just seemed to fail at what she tried her hand at mm. when it came to business. That whole money running through her hands problem. Right, yeah. I can see how that would not lend itself well to uh, official business as well as personal finance. Yes, now, during this time, Nightwood... Juna's masterpiece is published, the relationship that is modeled after Juna and Thelma's own relationship, mm -hmm. as depicted in the book. Thelma is not pleased. One can imagine. Yes, as we've gone over, there's misinterpretations of the ending of the novel, where a dog is incredibly nervous by a woman's drunken antics. Yes, and things happen <laughs> or are implied to happen or people assume happen who really knows juna would say that they didn't but anyway she hates the depiction of robin who is supposed to be her yes publicly she said it showed that juna didn't know her at all but privately she would admit that she knew her too well Ooh. <laughs> Yeah, I've been seeing some things recently about, like, oh, you know, breakup songs only show one half of the story and, and all of that. And I think there's some truth to that, especially if you really didn't connect to your partner in a relationship. But it's also something to be said for just not being very flattering to the other person. Yeah, it wasn't always the best relationship. Alcoholic fits and rages and cheating yeah. and flirting with other people in front of your partner. Right. Oh, so so where's Thelma now? What Where does she find herself at this point? Well, in 1942, she leaves Metcalf and moves out on condition that Metcalf would continue to help financially support her. And she actually, her story gets pretty quiet. Her last affair was with a Margaret Behrens, whom she had as the sole beneficiary of her will. And she moved in 1943 to the town of Monroe in Connecticut. And do we know what that life was like? Like, what did she do with her time? Her life was really quiet. She took walks, wasn't really in the public eye, wasn't doing a whole lot with art. Uh, Margaret would actually write to Barnes after Thelma's death and say that there was something cryptic Wood would say about having offended some muses, and that was the reason she couldn't be a great artist. Apparently, Barnes didn't know what that was about. That's really sad, though. <laughs> Poor Thelma. Anyway, she dies of breast cancer in 1970. Mm. That that just sounds like she had, like, 
opportunity and and she had some artisticness and yet it doesn't seem like she really fulfilled her potential there another lost artist in the same vein as dolly wilde yeah no like if i mean i mean she did die of breast cancer and not her alcoholism but it sounds like maybe if there had been better therapy at the time or she had had a stronger support network or someone had helped her figure out her finances. I don't know. Anyway, we have one more person. Now, Nating Huang, is she in any way related to Thelma Wood, or are we just kind of smushing them together for funsies? Smushing them together for funsies because there's not much said about either of them, so neither one could have a full-length episode about her. Gotcha, gotcha. So, we're just doing a little juxtaposition, a little, yeah, a little fun. So Nadine is born in Spain in 1902 to a Chinese diplomat father and a Belgian mother. Interesting already. So Spain, what's that like for her? Is that a good environment? We don't know. (laughs) Great. (laughs) The sentence we get throughout this. We do know that she doesn't see China till she was 10 and that she goes to college in Chicago where she studied law. All right. Anything about her interests? friends, hobbies. Not yet. What we do know, what we do know, and that I find incredibly interesting, is that at 20, she serves in the Chinese army for four years, probably during the Chinese Civil War, and comes out as a colonel. Did women normally serve in the Chinese army? No, she might actually be the first woman to reach a senior military rank in the Chinese army. Wow, that's pretty impressive. Do we have any sense of what drove her to do that? Like, did she have any particular patriotism or some sense of duty or just liked fighting? I think it was her father's influence. Did it seem like a like career move? As in, like, he had climbed high to the rank of diplomat so she could too if she showed the right patriotic fervor? Or was it more of a, like, he wanted to serve his country so she felt like she had to serve her country? More of the latter. Gotcha. We do know that her father died in 1926, though. Yeah. Was she still dependent on her family at that time? I think she would have gotten an inheritance. And also, you're in the army as a job. I'm pretty sure you're getting paid. Right. But I mean, like, like is, is that still a home base for her? Or is she establishing her own life? Oh no, she goes off and establishes her own life. So in the early 1930s, she moves to Paris to start a jade importing business. That seems out of left field. Um, why do we have any sense of why she does this or what appeals to her about it? Is she good at business? We don't really know. What we do know is that it fails. (laughs) So then we have a running theme between these two women, failed business ventures. Um, but she's in Paris now. What is, what is she going to do with that? Well, she ends up working for Natalie as a secretary in exchange for room and board and inevitably ends up in Natalie's bed. Right. As, as all attractive women must do. Now, how does this go? Like, like, is she, um, you, you know, you, you hear about, uh, powerful and important figures and their secretary and their secretaries, like, you know. There's there's this whole, like, power dynamic thing, and it's very, like, you know, usually it's the powerful, important man who's who's doing kind of a sexist thing there. Um, do we get this sense, or is it uh, more of a mutual thing? I believe it is a mutual thing. But again, we don't have a lot of evidence. No, what we do know is that she also becomes her chauffeur and would on occasion do some sword dance. We also have an anecdote that apparently in her military uniform and with a more masculine haircut, Andre Germain mistook her for a handsome man and flirted outrageously with her until he found out the truth. <laughs> Ooh, interesting. And and who is this who's flirting with her? Andre Germain is a French writer. Who was in this circle? Yes, and who is not straight. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, too bad. But I do love, I, I don't know if you heard the story about um, a twink and a butch lesbian um, kissing at Pride because they thought that each other were also of their own gender. Um, but it, I love that <laughs> this has happened 
since decades ago. <laughs> Centuries, in fact. All right, so anything else of note about, about Nadine and Natalie's affair? Well, she is the source of consternation to both Dolly Wilde and Romaine Brooks, other lovers of Natalie. So she actually, at one point, writes to Natalie, who's off on vacation, and claims that Dolly took a sapphire ring of Natalie's and sold it for drugs, and that she found drugs in Dolly's purse, and a letter saying something about 150 pounds of opium. How does Natalie treat this, and and does Nadine narc often? Well, this is the only example we have of this, Dolly Wilde, niece of Oscar Wilde, who had a pretty severe drug problem at the time, is furious over this, and Natalie doesn't like having tons of drugs in her house, so she actually kicks Dolly out of her house via letter, though she does try to help Dolly with drying out. But that is the end of what we know of Nadine's involvement. Gotcha. And we don't think this was like a jealousy thing. It was possibly a jealousy thing. There was a lot of minor jealous flare-ups with Natalie's many, many lovers. Fair enough. Now also, do we know if she's covered less because she's of Asian descent? Um, Or is it just kind of because she's not putting out artistic things? More that she's not putting out artistic things, and that probably if there is more written about her... It is probably in Chinese. Gotcha. Right. And so you're going to translate all sorts of French stuff. You might even learn Greek, but you're not going (laughs) to learn Chinese for this, too. I make no commitment to learning other languages for research purposes. Fair enough. (laughs) And I'm certainly not. I hope someone in China somewhere (laughs) knows a whole lot about Nadine Wong. And, and is enjoying that knowledge. Well, I assume there's probably at least one research paper written her, about her somewhere in China if she was, in fact, the first woman to reach a senior military rank in the Chinese army during the Chinese Civil War. Yeah, that makes sense. What we know here in another part of the world is that at some point her affair with Natalie ended, but Natalie did somewhat financially support her. She sent her money during World War II. That was really sweet of her. Yes, World War II is not the best time. Yeah, not the best time for anyone, really. What's Nadine up to? Nadine is incarcerated in Ravensbrook for the end of World War II. But what's that like for her? Do we have any record of the conditions? So the conditions at Ravensbrook which was mostly a place to hold female political prisoners. It was very much like the conditions at other concentration camps. So you don't have a lot of food, you're freezing. Pretty sure most people are aware of conditions and that I don't need to go into details. Mm-hmm. But suffice it to say, it was not a great time. No, it was not. And in fact, Nadine does not stay in Europe. After her release. Mm -hmm. She leaves for South America. Interesting choice. How come? We don't know. (laughs) (laughs) Of course. Again, the dead know, but they're not talking. Is this a better circumstance? Is, Is she able to kind of recuperate after all of this? I would say so, yes. What we do know of the little bit towards the end of her life after Paris is that she may have worked for an embassy in Venezuela. Hmm. All right. So she's taking that, like, military experience, the diplomatic background from her father. She's using her international knowledge. That makes sense. Sounds like it would have been a good place for her. Yes. And then the only other thing we know is that she died sometime in the 1970s in Brussels. How she got there? (laughs) Mysterious. She teleported. Right. It would be so great to know more. She sounds like a very interesting person with a very full life. Like, if you got an interview of her, oh man, this sounds like she would be a character. It reminds me slightly of Indiana Jones in terms of the jumping around the world having adventures. Yeah. 
Seriously. Ugh. No, it's it's really too bad that more of her life isn't known. Um, and especially more of like her her personal like creative life or um, what she felt about things. Because she really does sound like a, a character who would be worth hearing from. You may lead an interesting life, but you may still be posthumously smushed together. <laughs>